everybody so much for coming out tonight. Um, it's really great to see you all. And it's awesome to be in Austin today, um, 70 degrees warmer than it is in my home state right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, i just tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Indiana, in Indianapolis, and so I placed my, my baby there because it seemed like the best place for for me to start for writing. And, um, but I live in Madison right now um, with my husband and two dogs. My children are grown, and um, which gives me lots and lots of time for writing. So it's wonderful. Um, uh, um, I want to let you know too that since they don't have the book, um, I have copied out the first chapter for everyone. And I'm happy to sign the first chapter for anybody who wants it. And um, maybe that'll make you also want to buy the book later on. So it, come see me afterwards, and, um, and I'll have that for you. I'm not going to read the first chapter, though. Um, my book, Best Kept Secrets, is um, it's a detective novel, and it's a psychological thriller. And um, so it's kind of a cross genre. Your typical detective novel is all from the point of view of the detective. And this book has two points of view. So it's from my detective's point of view and also from, um, from another person's point of view. Um, both the women are searching for the same man um, who is the suspect in the murder that my detective is trying to solve. So I was going to read a chapter tonight that um, where you can meet both of the characters. And this is the first time that both of my characters meet each other. And I thought this way you'd get to know a little bit about each of them. It's chapter 28. In a coffee house near Indiana Office of Accountants, Morgan's breath caught in her throat at the sight of Karen Klein's blonde hair. She occupied a small round table filled with her computer and personal effects. Morgan leaned over her, a tiger hunting prey, and said, you're a hard woman to connect with, Miss Klein. The presence of police officers in the coffee shop evoked uncomfortable stares and nervous shifting from a few patrons, not from Karen, though, who answered, I work on location all over the state of Indiana. She didn't look up from her computer. We are aware of that. Morgan's fingers grazed the tattered notebook in her jacket pocket. This is my partner, Detective James. Behind her, Donnie flashed his badge. Karen's hand remained poised over her keyboard, her eyes on her computer screen. We want to ask you a few questions, Morgan stated. She noted that Karen wore an orange sweater and black slacks. Her shoulder-length blonde hair was not dyed like the shorter hairs found in Hallie's bed. Did Eckert have blonde hair too? Eckert is Karin's brother. You have questions about my brother. Karin's focus remained on her laptop. Morgan gently pushed the laptop closed. We'll only take a few minutes of your time. Karin grimaced, of course. She seemed reluctant, but tucked the laptop into the case and set it on the floor beside her feet. Morgan pulled out a chair where Karin's purse rested. Do you mind if I sit? Not at all. Karen moved stiffly when she put her purse in her lap and wrapped her arms around it, a shield. To be friendly, Morgan scooted the chair closer to Karen and, and leaned it forward on her elbows like she was getting gossip from an old friend. Does Eckerd live in Indianapolis? We had a stressful childhood. My mother left us when I was 10. My dad died before I graduated high school and Eckerd left me the day of my graduation. That's awful, Morgan said, noting the sad expression on Karen's face. But when Karen reached for a tissue, it seemed overplayed. Donnie hovered behind Morgan with his hands folded in front of him and said, you must have been 15 years when your dad died. Karen's expression was blank when she said, 15 and a half. My daughter Annabelle is 14, Donnie said. I can't imagine her without parents, and my older daughter isn't equipped to survive on her own. How did you do it? We did what we had to do, Karen said. Morgan expressed condolences and then said, you and your brother must have been very close. On the contrary, Karen said, I haven't seen him in years. With the notebook in her hand, Morgan's pen spun like a whirling dervish. You had a falling out. We did, 
Curran sat back and crossed her arms. What exactly are you looking for? Susan Aiken, Morgan said. You may remember her from high school. When Curran shook her head, Morgan said, she was a cheerleader and she dated your brother. Maybe that jogs your mom memory, Donnie added. Morgan thought she could get more out of this witness if Donnie wasn't towering over them. She turned around, hey, hey Donnie, can you get me a pumpkin spice latte with extra whipped cream? Uh, I'll pay you back. Okay. Morgan watched Donnie walk to the register and then turned back to Karen, leaning forward as if she had a secret. She told her, the parents are seeking closure. You understand, Karen. Is it okay if I, if I call you Karen or do you prefer Cece? No one calls me Cece. Morgan weighed the response. Irritation, something that was bothering, something was bothering Karen and now she was holding back. Okay. Karen, Morgan wrote that Karen might have lied about the nickname. That's an unusual name. What's this got to do with me? Karen asked, chafed. Can you remember a few deals, details about Suzanne since your brother dated her? I thought you could tell me about their relationship. I know it's been a long time since then. Morgan held her pen at the ready. 20 years, Karen stopped short of saying something else. Morgan's, Morgan's brow furrowed. Is that how long since she's seen him? She wrote 20 years in her notebook and then made a note to find out. Or something like that, Karen said. Something like that, Morgan drew in her breath. Later she looked up the dates, to, later she would look up the dates to see if they matched. Donnie returned to the table. Did you want regular or soy milk? Donnie averted, Morgan averted her gaze from Karen and looked up at Donnie. Regular, when have I ever put soy milk in my coffee? Angie's doing the soy thing, I forgot, he replied. Medium okay? I know better than to get you a large. Morgan, Morgan chuckled as Donnie returned to the counter. This won't take long, I promise, she said to Karen. Let me ask you a few more questions. Sure, Karen shook her head. No, in contradiction to her answer. Look, do you remember any details about Suzanne, particularly about their relationship? Was Suzanne cruel to your brother? Did they hike in the woods? What more can you tell me about them? I don't remember. As Morgan observed Karen, she recognized evasive behavior. Her back was rigid with, and ne neck muscles tight. Morgan didn't want to scare her away. She planned on having solid evidence before arresting anyone because this was the most important case of her life. She played her cards strategically. Do you keep track of local news, Karen? I'm more of a big picture person. Morgan noted the shifting back and forth of Karen's green eyes, the telltale sign of a lie. Then you didn't see that we found her body up near Fisher's. Karen raised their eyebrows and shook her head. She thought it unlikely, but perhaps by explaining the horrific details of Suzanne's discovery, the decaying, rotting corpse, she wanted to shock Karen into telling the truth. She may have been buried alive. Someone crushed her face in with a hammer and then buried her in the woods. I can't imagine what a teenage girl could have done to deserve that. People disappear all the time. Like your brother? Karen raised her eyebrows in agreement. Your brother, Eckert, dated Suzanne for what, almost a whole school year? No, I'd remember that. Eckert didn't date anyone. You don't say. Morgan wrote that down too. It was a flat out lie if she could believe other witnesses. Morgan looked into the small silver ring, looked at the small silver ring that Jeremy had given her and noticed that Karen too wore a sparkling diamond ring on her pinky. It looked like an engagement ring, Hallie's ring. The one, that, the one that the blue room bartender had seen had never been found. That's a beautiful ring. Karen spread her fingers and looked at her left hand. She took a quick breath, breath and said, thank you. It looks very special. It was a gift. Oh, Morgan was sure there was a story. If someone had given her a ring like that, she'd be sure to tell everyone. From who? My boyfriend gave it to me a few months ago. Can we get to the point? I need to get back to work. Karen looked at her watch. We know what the murder weapon was, Morgan reiterated. We know what killed Suzanne. The response was a glare. Where is your brother, Karen? In her seat, Karen shifted, not uncomfortable, but clearly agitated. 
I told you I haven't seen him. We're estranged. With, with each question about Eckert, Karin sat a little taller. So Morgan wondered if she was nervous or hiding something. She hoped that this next question would push her over the edge. She switched gears. You don't know a woman named Hallie Marks, do you? Did she go to Northside too? No, it urged Morgan that Karin remained so calm. Hallie used to hang out at the Blue Room. That bar's been around since, eight, since 1986. You've been there, Morgan asked hopefully. I do like jazz, I go there once in a while. Does your brother go there? How would I know? Karin had become impatient. Where is this leading detective? Morgan dug a photo of Hallie out of her jacket pocket and then slid it on the table in front of Karin. Do you remember this woman? She watched Karin's reaction closely, but Karin gave her nothing. No, Karin down the last sip of her coffee. I have to get back to work. My lunch hour is over and I haven't gotten a thing done. Detective Jules stood up. One more thing, Karin. When was the last time you saw your brother Eckert? 18 years, five months, and 23 days ago, Karin packed up her computer. That long? To Morgan, it sounded like she had counted the days since losing him, if that was the case. She had obsessed about it, too, and that was something Morgan knew a bit about. Obsession could take over a person's life. Thanks for meeting with us, Karin, she said. When Donnie returned with two steaming cups, Karin dismissed herself. Morgan felt confident that Karin had more information than she was letting on. She waited for her to leave, keeping an eye on her empty paper coffee cup. Once she left, causing a flurry of jingling doorbells, Morgan dug the cup out of the trash to submit for DNA tests. Does anyone have any questions?